So welcome back to our Inspire seminar series. This is the third one on the list. Um, I'd like to start by saying as we gather virtually today, we acknowledge that most of us at USASCAN CLS are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. So just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, this is a seminar series for INSPIRE, which is a synchrotron training program at the University of Saskatchewan and U of R, or University of Regina. Um, we are running this on alternating Wednesdays from 1.30 to 2.30 on Zoom. So if you have any speakers in mind that do any sort of synchrotron related research, um, please let us know and we'll, we'll put them in the list and see if we can ask them to speak here. Um, today, our speaker will be speaking for 50 minutes and there will be a 10 minute Q&A. And just for attendees, um, for the sake of bandwidth and stuff, please keep your video and mic off during the, pr the presentation. Um, if you have tech issues, please let Ardalyn or Lenore know. And if you have any questions for the speaker as, as she is presenting, you feel free to add them to the chat and I can read them out afterwards, or you can hold on to your questions to the end and I'll call on you when, when we get to the Q&A. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Stevens. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Saskatchewan. And today she'll be talking about photophysics and biophysics in University of Saskatchewan's chemistry department. Amy, the floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome on this very snowy Wednesday. Um, I'm going to be giving you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of research I do in USAS chemistry department. So I know I have photophysics and biophysics as my title, but I actually do chemistry as well. So, okay, just for anyone who is tuning in who's not in Saskatoon or has not been on campus, this is where I work. I love saying I work in the castle on campus. That's the chemistry department or part of the chemistry department. And this is my group. So these are some of the people whose work I'll be talking about. Tanish has done lots of the nanoparticle DNA work, which I'll get to at the end. Also is also working on DNA origami. Darshi and Johan and Sandra, to some extent, have all been working on the acetylene um, photophysics stuff. Okay, so what kind of work does my group do? So we're primarily a spectroscopy group, and we've done things like looking at 2D electronic spectroscopy of this is actually some compounds that we extracted from spinach leaves. We've also looked at porphyrins. These are some other nice conjugated rings that we've attached or our collaborators have attached to polymers. And we've looked at the physics of that and the chemistry of that. More recently, however, we've been looking at azulines either attached by linkers or looked at fused azulines with other rings and tried to understand what kinds of um, spectra we see. So uh, most recently, then we've been doing stuff with DNA origami. So we have some kind of origami structure like this that we want to make, and then we actually make it. And this is a TM image that we got only a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so what motivates our research, especially as I have these two kind of disparate sides of my research? program. So really it all comes back to light harvesting efficiency and the thing we think about when we think about light harvesting is solar cells. So here's a typical solar cell. This is the band gap of silicon here at around 1.1 eV. This is what it would look like. We have our valence band, our conduction band, and there are a few issues here. So one thing is if Photons come along and they're below the band gap, they're not going to be absorbed. So this whole region of the solar spectrum is wasted. Even if we do absorb photons, so they're high enough to get over the band gap, then to go to this part where it'll actually be used in the solar cell, it has to, whatever photon you've absorbed has to actually lose some energy. So then you lose energy through thermalization effects. There are a whole range of other effects that lead to low efficiencies, but these are two of the big ones. Then what does this really mean? This means that if you have a one sun illumination, which is how we measure this in the lab, 
There's a Shockley Kayser limit for a single junction solar cell, so a typical silicon uh, one junction solar cell. And the efficiency, the highest efficiency you can get at around 1.3 EV is roughly 33.7%. So that's a lot of the energy that could be absorbed and used is wasted in these things. So we want to use some of our molecules, especially energy transfer, things that our molecules can do, um, such as singlet fission to enhance the efficiency of solar cells. These could be a thin film of molecules that maybe coats the solar cell, and these two enhanced absorption. And also in the case of singlet fission, when you absorb one photon, you actually generate two excitations at the end. So this is could lead to kind of photon multiplication, which could definitely increase the efficiency of solar cells. So you could put 100% of your photons in and get 200% out. Okay, so this is a less exciting picture, but this is kind of how I think about it as a spectroscopist. So you have one chromophore here, and this is our ground state. This is our first excited state. And in our singlet states, this is why we have an S here, the, the electrons go into this in an anti-parallel fashion. Then we also have our triplet states. The electrons go into our triplet state in a parallel fashion. So that's why we have higher multiplicities for our triplet states. So we have one chromophore, we excite it into its first excited singlet state, then another chromophore. So again, when I'm saying chromophore, I just mean another molecule that can absorb light comes along. And this one excitation breaks into two triplet excitations. So now you've put in one photon, you've got two excitations out, and these triplet excitations can then flow through a solar cell, go to the electrodes and actually start an electrical current flowing. However, for this to happen, uh, there are some minimum requirements that are needed. So one, we have to have the right balance of energy levels. So if our triplet level is up here, we cannot make two singlets or two triplets from one singlet excitation. So our triplet has to be half or slightly less than half the energy of our singlet state. We also, because two chromophores have to come together to ensure this process occurs, we actually need multiple chromophores present and they have to have a correct distance. They can't be too close, so they act like a single chromophore. They can't be too far away so that the, their triplet states can't interact. So we need multiple chromophores present and their distance and orientation are really critical to make this whole process efficient. So we want to control the distance and orientation with scaffold. So I already showed you on a previous slide, we tried to use polymers as scaffolds, but what we'd really like to be able to do, this is kind of the overview of how everything comes together. We'd really like to have, be able to light harvest, so harvest light from the sun using some DNA origami as our synthetic scaffold. And then we'd like to incorporate some kind of dye molecules or chromophores that can undergo something like singlet fission. So again, we get in one photon, we get out two excitations, and therefore we can make a really efficient, say, film that could go on a solar cell or be incorporated in some other way. So this is kind of how I have these two sides. Okay, so we started looking at Ageline, as I also showed you, and I wanted to give you a bit of an idea why actually I mean why not any other kind of molecule there are molecules that undergo some good fission but there there are very small range of molecules that can undergo this we think that acetylene could be the next big class of molecules that might undergo this process okay so let's start by looking at naphthalene's energy levels it's a close cousin or an isomer of um Acetylene. So this is what a typical kind of ring, aromatic rings system. This is the typical kind of energy levels that they would have. We have our 
ground state, we have our first excited synchronous state, and we have a triplet state that's not halfway between. Um, it's slightly closer to our excited state than our ground state. However, if we look at azulene, we can see that this is, and this is, okay, so naphthalene, this is the typical way that most chromophores look. Azulene is quite strange in that the energy distance between the singlet state, the first excited singlet state, and our ground state is quite small. And the energy difference between our S2, so our second excited state, and our ground state, and especially the distance between our S2 and S1 state is really huge. So usually you have this large gap between your S0 and S1, and then our S2 would be up here somewhere. But here we have our S1 is really quite low. And then of course we have our triplet here. So already you can see that if we could excite into our S2 state, our triplets are roughly half the energy of our S2 state, and therefore we could potentially make two triplets. So why do we have these quite weird kinds of structure and or energy level differences in Ashley? So our HOMO or just ground state, these are this is showing the molecular orbitals. So where there is electron density in our ring, you can see for our HOMO we have say a lot of electron density on our one and three positions of our azulene ring. Whereas for our LUMAR, our first excited state, we have a very low amount of electron density. And then for our second excited state, again, we have a lot of electron density there. So this means that going from our HOMO to our LUMO state, the electrons feel a very small amount of repulsion because they're existing in different places around the ring. And therefore we have a lot less repulsion and our S1 level is a lot lower in energy than we would typically expect. And then our S2, we have electrons roughly in the same kind of areas and they experience more repulsion and then our S2 is higher. So this seems great. Our triplet level is roughly the same kind of half of our S2. It looks like this is quite a good thing. However, there is a problem. And the problem is that our S1 and our T1 states are so similar in energy that at room temperature, even if we make triplets, they can very easily go back into our singlet state and then they're lost to another energy decay pathway and we don't get out any light. So the amount of triplets we make are really, really minuscule and not enough to actually produce any efficient singlet fission. So that's an issue. So how can we overcome this main problem with azulene. So we have a couple of different ways that we're overcoming this. One, we're trying to couple azulenes together with these linkers. So we couple two or we can couple four. This is means that we can change the energy levels that we're exciting into and therefore hopefully separate out maybe the S1 and the T1 energy levels. So we don't get this sort of loss of triplets. So when you have a monomer, so a single azulene, you have a ground state and an excited state. When you bring these azulenes together or other molecules, you will get something that we call a dimer if we have two of them linked together. And their energy level in the excited state splits and you might get excitation into this state or excitation into that state. And again, you have some change of the energy levels that you're accessing. Okay, so that's what we did. First off, this is just an absorption spectrum of azulene to show that we really do measure spectra. So as I said, this is absorption. There's some kind of intensity or amount of absorption on our y-axis. On our x-axis, we have wavelength. Of course, I could put it in EV, but usually most of the things we're looking at occur in the visible region. So I like to think in terms of wavelengths. So this is kind of roughly bluish. Here we're getting into the more sort of red side of things. So our S1 um, energy absorption is quite low. You can see I had to really zoom in here. And it occurs between roughly sort of 500 and 700. Our S2 level is here. So roughly around sort of 325. And then these other energy levels that are here are even higher 
energy levels above S2, but we're only really interested in our S2 level here and our S1 level. Okay, and this is um, acetylene just floating around in solution at a reasonably low concentration. Okay, so when we then do the same thing with our calyx acetylene, so that's our four acetylenes linked with linkers, we see that we do get a redshift because they're coupled more closely. And so we have started to sort of change their energy levels a little bit. Another way that shows we've we've changed something is that if you look at their fluorescence, so now this we've excited into an excited state and we're looking at the fluorescence that we get at the light that we get from our molecules. So here we have a nice fluorescent spectrum. Usually almost every molecule that you would excite, you would get fluorescence from their singlet excited state. But azulene again is quite different and we actually get fluorescence only from the S2 state. This is actually quite a strange thing already. And then when we look at our calyx, we actually completely get rid of all the fluorescence we saw before. And that's showing that we have some other de-excitation state or pathway that our excited excitations are going through. So instead of giving out fluorescence, they're now finding another pathway back to the ground state. So this is kind of interesting. It showed us that we had some other things um, going on and we could, by changing the energy levels, we could see some very big, large differences in their absorption and their fluorescent spectrum. So another way we've been trying to overcome Agiline's problems is by fusing Agiline with other rings. So we looked at this molecule called 1,2-benzagiline. So again, you just basically have your Agiline, you attach a benzene ring to it. Here we I'm looking at the absorption, so at lower wavelengths or higher energy, and this is the fluorescence at uh, longer wavelengths or lower energy. Here, I'm looking at the S2 state, not the S1 state, even though that is there as well. So you could, I'm not showing it here, but there is actually a redshift of all these things compared to, to normal acetylene, but also there's this so-called mirror image relationship. So the left and the right look pretty similar. So this is showing that we've made this whole molecule by adding this extra benzene ring to it a lot more rigid. And we're seeing a very, very strong vibration. In fact, if you measure this and you compare it to some Raman spectroscopy you can do, you'll see that this is a ring stretching vibration that is showing up in the energy levels. So this is just giving you a, a hint of what I'm going to explain when we talk about the laser setups that we have in the department. This is some um, lifetime measurements I made on this molecule in different solvents. So here we have some kind of fluorescence intensity and our x-axis here is in terms of picoseconds. So we can measure some fairly um, short-lived energy levels here. Okay, so this, gave us, uh, again, some interesting energy level changes. We also enhanced some vibrations of, of this molecule. However, we didn't really improve any single fission that we are hoping to see. So the third way we've been trying to overcome Ashley's problems, and this is one of my students, Dashi, who I already showed, has been working on this since she started her PhD. We've been trying to add substituents to the Ashley. So here I'm just putting up what I had before, the molecular level, <laughs> molecular um, orbitals of acetylene. So again, HOMO is our ground state, LUMO is our S1 state, LUMO plus one is our S2 state. So this is just, she's been looking at three or four of these, but this is just one example. So this is substituting an electron donating group at odd positions of our acetylene. So now we have chlorines here. So if you look closely, um, at our molecular um, orbitals again. We'll have chlorines attached here and here, here and here, and here and here. So because if you attach a chlorine here, there's no electron density, it doesn't really do much. The LUMO level, the S1 level is pretty much unchanged. Whereas the HOMO level now 
uh, increases in energy a little bit, and the LUMO plus one level, our S2 level, also increases in energy, but slightly less. So we've effectively changed the ground state to S1 energy difference and the S1 to S2 energy level difference. So again, if we look at in blue here is just our acetylene, and in yellow now is our chloroacetylene. You can see again there's a redshift. The intensities don't change very much, but we we are seeing some differences here. Okay, so just again to show you that we see something different because from this sort of steady state absorption spectrum, other than some red shifts and some kind of intensity changes, there's not too much we can say about this. But when we measure the dynamics of their energy level, so again, we're looking at the fluorescence lifetime of these different states. This is looking at the S2 state. You can see for most of these, for acetylene and our 13 dichloroacetylene that I showed on the previous slide, there's not really a whole load of difference. There's a, there's a little bit of change, but their lifetimes are roughly around one nanosecond. And this is just their quantum yield. So you don't need to worry about that too much. However, I didn't show this, but we have a cyanoacetylene as well. And this looks really quite different. Here, we to fit it properly, we actually need to fit the lifetimes with two different times. So something that's roughly 0 0.2 nanoseconds and something that's two nanoseconds. So this also tells us that we're seeing, changing these energy levels, we're actually seeing some different energy pathways that these excitations are going through to get back to the ground state. So it's not just fluorescence, there are other things happening along. So we're, we're continuing all this work and we're seeing some pretty interesting stuff. So I thought I should tell you, instead of going through all the photophysics of actually in all our different samples in great detail, I'd tell you a little bit about how we actually measure these lifetimes in the lab downstairs. And at the moment, or our laser systems are housed in the SSSC in the basement of chemistry. So that's the Saskatchewan Structural Sciences Centre. So we have a great technician there who helps us keep our laser systems running and also can train students. So that's pretty handy. So when you go down into the basement, underneath the basement ground floor of chemistry, you'll find a lab like this. Uh, as most laser labs, it looks a little bit messy. You've got cables everywhere, but this is our pump laser here. This is our main laser. So this is our Thai sapphire laser that actually generates our pulses in the end. Uh, this is a pulse picker. So some other stuff goes on in there. This part here, we can change our the light we get out by putting it through a crystal that changes the light. So instead of having, say, 800 nanometer light, which is way into the red part of the spectrum, we can change that into 400 nanometer light, which is blue, which is kind of perfect for exciting some of our molecules. So then we go into this box, which just has a, a mirror, and then we go through here, and this part here, at, right at the other side of the table again, is our um, where we actually measure our, um, our put our sample and then detect our fluorescence. So this is uh, the sample holder. We put our cuvette typically. Most of the time we do things in solution, but we also can change this out and put in um, a thin film holder instead. And our fluorescence goes in here and is detected. So. So this is called TCSBC, which is time correlated single photon counting. And depending what um, wavelength of light that we detect, we can detect fluorescence coming from an S2 level or an S1 level if acetylene actually fluoresced from S1. So we can, we can look at uh, the lifetimes of different energy levels. So how this occurs is kind of an electronic um, technique. So we have our laser pulse here, and you can't see it, but right beside the laser or beside this box, we have a little photodiode that detects whenever we see a laser pulse. That same laser pulse goes all the way through our system and gets to our cuvette here and excites it. 
or the molecules inside and they emit fluorescence and that then gets detected at some later time. So whenever the time between the photodi photodiode being triggered and the fluorescence being detected right at the end of the system, that gives us a start stop time. So here it's, for instance, 3.4 nanoseconds. Then we have a small amount of dead time and then our next pulse comes and triggers a photodiode. And in, you can see between these two laser pulses, no fluorescence was detected by our detector. And then the next time our photodiode gets triggered and our sample is excited, we get another lifetime. Here we have our fluorescent photon coming in at 4.7 nanoseconds. So if you do this over and over and over and over again, you can build up a histogram of this is kind of the other way around. I would usually put counts on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, but it doesn't really matter. At different times, you can build up how many counts or photons of fluorescence you actually detect at different times. And then you can fit this with a nice exponential and that can give you a lifetime. So just to show you some data, because I showed you some up conversion data, which is what I'll talk about in the next slide. But I thought I'd show you something that isn't Azuli. So these are actually some perovskite thin films from Tim Kelly, also in the chemistry department. Uh, we, our group measured some lifetimes for him. So again, as I said, we can measure thin films. It's not just molecules in solution. So this was our kind of short time measurement. So again, this is all in terms of nanoseconds. So we can measure out from roughly zero to around 60 nanoseconds. And we can fit that when we got a lifetime of around 40 nanoseconds. So great. And just to mention, this is we're looking at the fluorescence at 780 nanometers, so very close to the IR. And also, I put this on a log plot so that any exponential decays look straight, just because it's easier to see a straight line and know that you can fit it with one exponential instead of if it's curved, then you need to add extra exponentials to fit, fit your curves properly. Okay, then if we change the repetition rate of our laser so that the space between our pulses is longer, then we can actually measure out all the way to 1200 nanoseconds. So now we're actually getting into the microsecond um, time scale. So this is, this is about as far as we can go um, while still having some, uh, as you increase the repetition rate of your laser, the amount of intensity of laser light that comes out is quite low. So this is about as long lived as we can go for it. Uh, can measure. Anyway, so as you can see, there's a curve here. So we can fit this thing with now two exponentials and we get the same fit for our short times, which is 40 nanoseconds. And we can actually fit our longer time, which is 133 nanoseconds. So um, Tim can come along and he knows how his perovskites work and that he has little kind of different crystallites in there. And you can try and work out what these lifetimes correspond to. So this is a really nice and pretty simple technique. The good thing is you don't need a lot of fluorescence because most of the time you want only one photon being detected per distance between your, or per cycle. So between your pulses from your laser. So this is, this is a good technique. Now, the other technique we have is our picosecond range fluorescence up conversion technique. So this is where we start getting really into nonlinear optics. So this is two different views of kind of very close to the sample part of the system. So we again, we have a laser, it's generating pulses. We do something along the way called um, frequency doubling, which means that instead of having 800 nanometer light, we now have 400 nanometer light, which is more appropriate for exciting most of our lasers. That involves just putting the light through a nonlinear crystal. Okay, so now we have this 400 nanometer light and we still have a little bit of residual 800 nanometer light from our laser. And this is where our sample sits. Again, I haven't put a cuvette in, but we usually have a thin path length cuvette. We also put a little stir bar in there and this thing rotates and 
rotates the stir bar in the cuvette because there's quite a lot of energy going into this cuvette, so we don't want to destroy the sample, so we keep it stirring. Uh, this is just a lens, this is a filter, and then this in this large holder here actually is a nonlinear crystal that can do this up conversion process. So this is another, and this is our detector here. If you look from the, from the detector, so here's our detector, this is our crystal. This is where fluorescence from our sample will hit our crystal. And then from here to a mirror here through this lens, this is where a second beam of light, the red 800 nanometer light for our laser also hits the crystal. And from those two beams, we generate an upconverted signal. So hopefully this will make it slightly simpler. So we have our laser pulse that is going through our system. We also get some fluorescence coming from our sample. And we need to um, focus them onto the crystal. So they need to go pass through the crystal and be the same place spatially. But also these pulses need to coincide in time. So if you have like the laser pulse here and the fluorescence pulse here, we're not going to need a signal. They actually need to overlap in the crystal, not just spatially, but also in time. And we need to get out our upconverted signal. It's really quite weak. So to get the maximum signal possible, we need to change the angle of our nonlinear crystal so we can actually get an appreciable upconversion signal. This is why that crystal is in such a large holder, so that we can rotate it and move it around in all three directions. OK, so why does this give us picosecond lifetimes? or picosecond resolution. So this is our excitation pulse. It's really short. It's around sort of 100 femtoseconds in width. And this is our large fluorescence spectrum that would come from our sample. And what we are doing is we can delay where our so-called probe or our original laser pulse, where it, which part of the fluorescent spectrum it overlaps with. So it can overlap here at one time or here. So we can move this around in time. And where these things coincide, we'll get something called a sum frequency pulse. So I put this in blue because when you combine these sort of greenish fluorescence and our red 800 nanometer laser pulse, we get out something in the UV spectrum, uh, the UV range. So then we can delay this at another point and we get another some frequency pulse. And if we measure all of these, we're basically taking very, very small slices of our fluorescence and therefore we can get picosecond time resolution. Instead of having this large extended fluorescence pulse, we can take lots and lots of small points based on our short probe pulses. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the things we do in the lab. Um, this involves just spending a couple of days getting everything working nicely and getting everything overlapped and then actually doing the measurements is fairly quick. Okay, so that's great. We can do spectroscopy. We love being in the lab with lasers. The other side of things, and my students get to actually be above ground and do things with DNA. So. When you think about origami, you think about making a really nice crane or something like this from paper. So what I'm talking about when I discuss DNA origami, I'm talking about taking some kind of structure that we've designed on a computer and turning it into a real life structure made of DNA. So here, this is called a wireframe DNA structure because we're only really taking these edges and vertices and making a structure from that. So what do people use DNA origami for? Well, a whole range of things. Um, one kind of cool thing that I, I found yesterday. So this is a nanotube and they put some DNA um, or attach some DNA to it. And they've got this particle also attached to some DNA. And this thing can move from DNA strand to DNA strand and therefore walk along this nanotube. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I also really like this example. So it's a DNA origami box that someone has made. And this is some kind of load. They would load it 
in the future with some kind of therapeutic molecule that they want to go somewhere in your body, maybe um, attack a cancer cell or yeah, attack some cancer cells or something. So they made this box and they have all these kind of single stranded DNA strands around the edge of the box. And when you change the pH, it just so happens that these strands here um, fold into double helices and the box closes. So it, whether this is open or closed depends on the pH of the solution it's in, which is really good because if it goes into your body and you need to get it to a certain pl place and you don't want it to just open straight away, it's good if you have some sort of pH control on this. The other nice thing is you can say attach some dyes to different parts of the box. And when it's open, you'll get say some light from one of your dyes. And when it's closed, you'll get light from the other dye. So you can actually tell spectroscopically whether this thing is open or closed without imaging it all the time. So that's kind of a nice, it's DNA origami, but you also have some sort of fluorescence going on with it. I think I need a quick throat wetter. Okay, so how does DNA origami work? So the general methodology is fairly simple. You have usually designed whatever structure you want to make on a computer. You get this single-stranded DNA scaffold. It's a really long scaffold. Usually it's, act, it's combined, it's in, in, a, in a circle. And it's, I don't know, 2,000 or 7,000 bases long. They usually get these from um, some bacteria, I think. And then you have these really short staple strands that bind to certain parts of this scaffold strand and form whatever structure you hopefully design properly. And uh, I guess you don't just put them in a solution. So this is usually a buffer solution. You have some kind of salt in there and then you heat it up overnight and you cool it down really, really slowly so that these bonds between the scaffold and the staples have time to form and arrange properly. And hopefully you get out these nice, uh, in this case, it's some kind of wireframe structure and you have uh, staple strands left over that you need to purify away. So to get a good uh, folding and a good efficiency of folding, you need to have a large excess of staple strands and you always need to clear those out at the end. Okay, and depending on what size of scaffold you have, whether 2,000 or 7,000 bases, you get different sizes of these structures. And now people, I mean, this is a few years old now, people can make actually really large structures. So this is still fairly small. So the thing that people don't really emphasize when they're talking about DNA origami is that the staple strands are the really, really important part. The scaffold strand is fine. It, you just need a certain length so that you can fold it into some sort of shape. But it's the staple strands that are really doing what's called crossovers. So for instance, if you have, I like this, you're trying to make sort of a flat 2D tile out of DNA origami, and you have uh, say in blue, this is one single-stranded DNA part of your scaffold. The staple strands are the things that actually will bind here and then cross over to the sort of single-stranded DNA that's forming the other part of your tile and will bind there. So you have crossovers here and you have crossovers here. And these are the things that really hold whatever structure that you're trying to make together. So this is shown kind of more easily here. So you have one kind of, um, let's have a look. So you have one sort of crossover here, it's going through here and it's crossing over between all these different other um, parts of your scaffold. And the important thing is to make sure that these crossovers are in the appropriate places, because if you don't, if um, say you try and bind it here, then you would get some, this DNA would need to twist so that it could bind appropriately, appropriately to your staple. So you need to be really careful about where your crossovers occur and whether they're in the right direction or not. 
Okay, so this is kind of staples are really holding your whole structure together and you need to design this really, really carefully so that you, if you want a flat tile, you have a flat tile and for instance, it's not sort of stretching or folding, uh, rolling up because you have sort of the crossovers in the wrong places. Okay, so just some real data because a couple of years ago now, we got our first DNA origami structure folded. This is just a gel, um, so an electrophoresis gel. We put some current across it. We loaded up our wells here with some DNA. So this is a little bit of biochemistry uh, characterization now. So this is our marker. This tells us what kind of sizes we expect at different positions. This is our scaffold here. So it was around, yeah, like two, 1.7 there kilobases. And then when we anneal our DNA, so we've heated it up and hopefully you've got folded DNA, it's we can see here now it's slightly larger, which we would expect because the scaffold is now hopefully combined with all the staples and we've got a large structure. And then we have our excess staples that are really, really low in um, mass. So this was the first one that we actually made. You can then, hopefully you can see this, it's kind of an L-shaped structure. So it's wire framed and you've got these holes that are gaps between all the double-stranded helices. So this is an AFM image that was actually done in a liquid cell. This is why you have this kind of echo. I don't think this is another real um, structure. It's kind of because it's moving through solution and you're trying to image it, you've got this kind of other AFM echo, I call it. Anyway, so this was really, really nice. We got this first structure made and it was really just something that we thought was interesting. And we saw, uh, we got the different strands that we needed um, from the literature. So more recently and more successfully, we've, um, again, the same thing happens for every structure we make. You start off with a scaffold, you get some staples, and we actually buy them from a company. We don't make them ourselves. And you anneal by heating and cooling, and you get some kind of structure. So here, uh, this is another fairly uh, robust, I would say, structure that you find in the literature. Um, it's nice it's a triangle you have lots of places where you can attach different things say dyes and so forth chromophores and because you don't just have like the wireframe one helix around the outside you have sort of four four or five this thing folds well and folds with quite high efficiency so this is our latest thing that we've made and this is really the kind of thing we're going to start attaching dyes to Okay, so these are literally last week's results. This is an AFM image. It's two uh, microns across here. We could zoom in a little bit, but anyway, we can do that. So you can see these things have been made pretty well. There is a hole in the center like we expect, and the edges are fairly thick. So we are quite happy to see so many triangles all looking quite nicely made. This is a TEM image that we did a few days later. Uh, and here the scale is 100 nanometers. It looks a bit weird because I've taken sort of two images or two different parts of the image and just zoomed into them so that you can see them a bit easier. So again, the triangles look like they've been made fairly nicely, but you also have some ones that are a bit bent and kinked. Uh, I Because when you do the TEM, you can't image um, these DNA directly, you have to stain them. I think the stain is kind of affecting them slightly and they're not as beautiful as they look in the AFM. Anyway, so this, the, this is the way we do characterization. We do some biochemistry, we run a gel, kind of get an idea of their rough size. Then we might do some purification. Then we try and actually image them visually by some microscopy technique like AFM or um, TM. So just to give you an idea of what we're gonna do with our dyes, we're using something called cyanine molecules that intercalate between base pairs in DNA. So we've looked at these first, just by trying to get them to sort of aggregate together and measure their, um, measure them spectroscopy, 
spectroscopy um, in a spectroscopic way. So this is what your cyanine molecule looks like. You have these kind of rings and they're attached by a conjugated bridge. The different numbers of the cyanine molecules correspond to the different numbers of these um, bonds that you have. So you might have cyanine 2, cyanine 5, cyanine 3.5, for instance. We have cyanine 3 and cyanine 2. This is just the absorption of one and the fluorescence emission of the other because we're actually going to use these molecules, hopefully in our DNA, to see some kind of energy transfer processes before we even think about going to single fission. And this was just to confirm that hopefully we will actually be able to see some energy transfer between these things. So this is ongoing. We've done the spectroscopic characterization of the molecules themselves. And now we're binding them with DNA to see kind of what results we get. And we've already started to get a few results that look interesting. Okay, so project two and the last thing I'm going to talk about in the last two minutes is uh, a project that started just by chatting with Belinda Hine from uh, U Calgary. So she's interested in nanoparticles, silver and gold nanoparticles. And she wanted to know if we could tether them together with DNA. So why is she interested in nanoparticles? Well, this is because of surface plasmon resonance. So if you have some nanoparticles and they interact with an electric field, you can get some kind of, um, you can generate some electric field in the nanoparticles on the surface of the nanoparticles. So the electron cloud can actually kind of oscillate with the electric field. So this is quite nice. Um, it's an interesting effect. And we hope that we could help her by tethering them with DNA. So what are these nanoplasmonic applications of nanoparticles? So if you excite them with light, you can get a temperature increase. You can get a, an electric field. You can also generate a hot, so-called hot electron that can go to um, some molecular reactant nearby. So if you also have something like a catalyzer, you can get sort of electron hole separation. And these processes are all enhanced by having your plasmonic nanoparticle that you're exciting with light and getting it to have this plasmonic resonance. So again, you can get efficient electron hole separation um, by heat or by this electric field enhancing that effect or this hot electron transfer. So hot electron just means the electron is highly excited. Okay, so these are some things that why people would be interested in metal nanoparticles. So what is our idea? So this is my nice schematic of a gold nanoparticle and a silver nanoparticle. We attach them to DNA that has a thiol group on them. So we mix these at room temperature and the thiol and the gold, and the thiol actually in the silver, less efficiently, but it still works. These will naturally find each other in solution and bind. Then we put in our complementary strands. So this part will bind to this part. This part here will bind to this part of the DNA. And then we've tethered them. The great thing about DNA is because we know how many base pairs we have and where they should attach, we know really clearly what the distance between these nanoparticles are. So we can correlate the characteristics that we see with their distances. So that, that's why DNA is a really powerful tool for this. And we can change the distance based on how long these strands are. However, when we're looking at our TM or AFM, it's really difficult to tell whether this or this, like if we have silver, if we have gold, if we have something else. So we decided to try and make triangles instead of um, silver spheres. This was interesting because nanoparticles don't like to be anything other than spherical. However, uh, just to give you a few results of this, uh, we, I think this is a TM image or maybe an SEM image of some triangles that Tanish made in the lab. You can see that we have sort of a variety of shapes. Some are triangles, 
Some are triangles with their sort of apexes shaved off of it. We also have something that looks more like we have five sided polygons, but generally we kind of have triangles and these are quite flat. So very different to our spherical um, silver nanoparticles. When we have tried to tether this so far, um, you can see, I think this was just triangles or maybe this is a, uh, a gold sphere that's a bit oddly shaped. You can see that the issue we're having is we have nanoparticles and we have DNA, but we're not really getting the lovely idealized straight bit of DNA with some uh, nanoparticles attached. We're getting a whole bunch of extra DNA. This is an unpurified sample. The problem we're having is when we try and purify the sample, the nice structures we've made get disintegrated. So we're looking at more gentle ways of purifying and getting rid of some of the excess DNA that we don't want. Actually, on Friday, I was talking to Tanish and he used a really, really low concentration of DNA. And we got to the stage where we're having lots of nanoparticles and you can see the DNA single strands attached to them. But now there, there's not enough DNA to attach them together. So this is our kind of upper bound of too much DNA. We now have our lower bound of too little DNA. We're going to explore the space in between and hopefully get some good uh, dimers actually formed. So the other way we characterize these things, because it's hard to know how much of these things you've actually made. So to get a concentration, we measure some absorption versus, versus wavelength graphs. This is kind of uh, gold nanoparticles, so the spheres attached to different sequences of the DNA. And you can see it's all fairly similar. It's gold nanoparticles. Here is the plasmonic peak. This is the part you measure, and you can get a concentration from that. The interesting thing of going from spheres to triangles for one of them is the plasmonic peak that you measure. So in the last slide, it was sort of around five. 29 or so, that's the plasmonic peak, roughly around the peak area. As you change the shape and change the size of these things, where you expect the plasmon peak to occur changes. So for our triangles that Tanish measured, they are roughly around 70 nanometers. So if we go across here, our plasmonic peak for those is roughly around 650. So, uh, yeah, we were trying to work out what the concentration was uh, based on sort of what plasmonic peak we think we had. And that involved the whole calculation, but we actually managed to get a really nice value. So because of this, when you mix these together, so ignore the red line, the kind of gray line is when we just mixed silver and gold nanoparticles together without any DNA. We just wanted to see if there was any effect of just having these mixed in solution. And then you take just gold or just silver absorptions and you try and fit those together with our um, measured mixture. We can actually fit these really nicely, which means that we're not seeing any extra effect from just having gold and silver in solution. And you can also see that depending on whether the triangles or the gold are more concentrated, you get these different sizes of peaks at different positions. So they're both plasmon resonances, but they're in different positions because of their different sizes and shapes. Anyway, so we're gonna do more of this. I think if we make these solutions a little bit more concentrated, we might see some other effects. Okay, so this is basically the last slide. The next step is I would love to measure these origami structures with SACS. So I want to actually go to the CLS and do some X-ray measurements. This is just a paper I found yesterday that's reasonably recent. They were looking at these flat tiles. Uh, so they have flat tiles that they've braced with extra pieces of DNA to keep them flat. This, these ones are partially folded, and this is where they've actually folded up these tiles into tubes. And you can see when you measure the sacs, uh, or you measure them with sacs, you do get some nice results. So this is showing the folded up tubes. It has the 
highest Q value and sort of the largest peak. This means it's the least extended, so it's rolled up. This shows the peak kind of roughly here, and it has a lower Q. This is showing uh, sort of a middle. I'm running out of time. Anyway, so this is this is the next step. And then just acknowledgements, the SSSC is really, really important. Our collaborators at Melbourne. Uh, I didn't show you Stephen. He did all the Ben's Ashley work. And that is all for me. Thank you so much, Amy. That is really cool. And also a little bit really weird, especially with the DNA origami. Um, um, weird is good, I guess. <laughs> No, it's a good weird. I've just I I really need to know more. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we do still have a few minutes. Um, feel sure. Free I'm sorry I went over time. I just get excited oh, and I always rush the DNA origami path. But anyway, yeah, I'm more than happy to stay for a few minutes and um, ask. So or I, answer even. Uh, there are a couple questions in chat, but. For anyone else, if you are shy and don't want to ask a question yourself, feel free to drop into chat and I'll read it out for Amy, or you can raise your hand um, in Zoom and I'll call on you. So two questions from Ardalan. Could the observed difference in fluorescence for the calyx for arene be attributed to ring inversion? If so, is it possible to introduce substituents to make the structure more rigid in order to test this hypothesis? Uh, yeah, you can always make it more rigid for sure, because the, the linkers we ha have are just, um, they don't have double bonds or anything, they're just single bonds, so we could change the linkers, definitely. The observed difference is not due to ring inversion. We looked, so I didn't show too much about this, but if you look at the kind of S1 region and the S2 region, you see two very, very different effects. In the S1 region, it looks like these molecules act almost separately. So it's like the acetylenes are not even interacting, they're acting like four separate acetylenes. But where in the S2 region, the redshift is a lot more pronounced and also the difference in intensity for the calyx versus the just the pure azulene is such that it seems that in that case, we have kind of electron, an electron cloud sort of over the whole um, ring. It's like these things are acting really, really, or coupling really strongly together. So uh, we also did other measurements. So the fluorescence, you just lose the fluorescence. The problem with, and something I didn't mention is the reason why um, I would like to get some more laser stuff downstairs. It's because everything we have down there for measuring lifetimes is due to fluorescence. So the problem is triplets don't typically give out any fluorescence. So we need to actually do absorption based measurements that also have kind of some time. Um, so we can do something called transient absorption measurements. And that would, uh, they've done some of those for us in Australia. And it, what we think is happening in the calyx was confirmed with those measurements. So we're definitely not seeing ring inversion, but that's that's a really interesting idea. And we could definitely make these things more rigid. The main problem with them is that dissolving them in anything was really tricky. So that was um, actually dissolving them and making nice solutions was a pain. So I think it will be nice to deposit them on some kind of, and make some thin films, and that would be even more interesting. So I hope that answered your first question. So the second question, um, can the chirality of DNA origami structures be controlled and is it possible for them to induce chirality in metal nanoparticles? Yes, the chirality definitely can be controlled. Um, you can, and you can form almost any structure that you can imagine. So I've seen wireframe structures of like, that look like bunny rabbits and things like that. But yeah, at a more fundamental level, yes, you can change the chirality of the DNA origami. And there are papers that show when you have nanoparticles decorated along, um, different, along a piece of DNA origami, you can induce very interesting chiral effects. So I've seen papers that, yeah, they just have one really long strand of DNA origami and they put nanoparticles around. Uh, 
the right-handed and sort of a left-handed way, and they've shown different chiral effects. So that's a really interesting question. It has been shown somewhat, um, and I can send you those papers if you're interested. But yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Thank you. Art, so Arlen's just saying thank you so much, Amy. Also for thank me you. too. Um, I have a question for you myself. Are yeah. there are there any resources you can re recommend for learning more about DNA origami? Because that's just it's so cool, all the stuff that you can do, and I really want to know more. Uh, I so there are so we buy all our DNA origami actually from companies once we've designed the structures. So we, the companies have a lot of resources, but honestly, just getting a good sort of review paper from the literature is a great way to start. Um, there are lots of really good reviews out there that really go through like from how this thing started to where it is now to, you know. So just a really, really good general review paper. Again, I can send you some if, if you want some recommendations. That would be just great. Ask and I'm, I'm happy to share. Actually, the interesting thing is, so the DNA origami, it started through people noticing holiday junctions in natural structures. And some of these things are mobile and some of them aren't. So that started, I don't want to say the date because it was a long time, maybe the 1950s holiday. The scientists like noticed these things, but it wasn't until 2006, Paul Rosamond and his group actually formed the first real 2D origami sort of sort of tiled structures. And it's this really famous, if you just Google DNA origami, this smiley face kind of structure will come up. And that that is the first DNA origami sort of official um, time it was it was made. So holiday junctions, you can make these nice wireframe kind of 3D structures. Um, but there's a limit to the kind of shapes you can make. Whereas then when you get to DNA origami, you have these different tiles, then you can do almost anything you can think of. And these things are getting even larger and it has extended into sort of RNA origami now as well. So it's getting more interesting all the time. Man, that is so cool. So unfortunately we have run out of time and I don't see any other questions. So thank you so much, Amy, for coming and giving a seminar here. Yeah, um, no, uh, thank you for having me. So for everyone else, um, yeah, there's a few people thanking you. Um, so two weeks from now, we will have Derek Peak joining us for a seminar, and he's a professor from the uh, Environmental Soil Chemistry. So tune in two weeks from now. That would be May 3rd at 1.30, and we'll see you then. Cool. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you.